Hello, I'm Mark Pikert, Editor-in-Chief of The Gay Goods, and today is my very first three-way. No, not that kind. I mean the interview kind. I have not one, but two great porn star guests today. Le Grand Wolf himself, one of the greatest porn stars of all time. I'm not just saying that because he signs my checks. And Peter Pounder, who is, well, he has some really big news. I'm not going to tell it. It's not my story to tell. And I'm all about letting other people tell their stories. Isn't that what we learned from 2020? Let's bring them on now. I'm really excited to do this. Hello, gentlemen. Hello, hello. hello. Uh, Peter, so you and Legrand go way, way back, uh, longer than I have been in the porn industry, but not so long that it makes the two of you old. Fair. Sounds that right. perfect. That perfect middle ground of you're still young. <laughs> so uh, you originally started working with Legrand on uh, Mormon Boys, correct? Yes. So how did you, how did the two of you connect? Uh, I was <clears throat> camming and looking for other opportunities online. And then I found an opportunity online to fly out and try uh, gay, straight and kink stuff. So I came out and I shot a bunch of stuff and that's how we met <laughs> in this short form. So LeGrand, how do you typically find models? Uh, well, in this case, uh, Peter reached out to us. Um, and he was pretty quick to, you know, do the things that we want to do anyway, right? So we usually want to uh, have some type of visual uh, interview with them, Skype, FaceTime, whatever. He right out the gate said, you know, I want to know that he kind of, I felt like he was sort of feeding uh, me the lines that I feed other people. I want to make sure that you're real. I want to make sure that you're not like some type of creeper. Um, I want to make sure that, you know, you, you look like your pictures. And I was like, that's, these are all my lines. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, so uh, I hopped on um, my internet connection uh, in my car, kind of popped it open. I was sitting in you know some parking lot in Minneapolis, um, and there's Peter looking exactly like he looks right now, um, saying, asking me you know many, 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 many questions. Uh, so it was about half an hour of sort of being peppered with questions about the adult industry, which were all fantastic questions. Um, and at the end of it, he's like, "Okay, I'm ready. I want to come out." I was like, "Okay, well, that's great." But you know, uh, and I was like, "You know," so I mean, usually what we'll do, right? Well, I'll, I'll let people. Know. I'm like, "Just so you know, this is you know forever. Uh, if you're gonna do porn," um, and he's like, "If I'm not gonna do it with you, I'm doing it with someone else." Also, I've been online. Also, I've been camming. Also, also, also. And he was like, like "Miles an hour," and I was like, "Cool, okay." Um, anyway, so you got to the end of the conversation, and. You know, Peter's made the decision that he's going to come out. Uh, I'm, you know, flattered, and and uh, and of course he's he's adorable. Um, we had a couple of additional things to discuss because that we were going to do um, shooting that wasn't just gay, uh, wasn't just um, kink. It was also going to be some straight shooting. Um, and Peter didn't have um, experience at that time uh, having sex with men, not really. Um, and uh, so we had some additional things to discuss, and I knew there were going to be some follow up conversations. But he was very eager. So Peter, was it a relief to start doing porn after camming? Because camming is brutal work. No one really talks about how hard it is to cam all the time. Yeah. So I didn't know like the journey either, how it works with camming. And like, I only did one to two hours. I find I found out later, a lot of other people do like four plus hours. Um, that's not for me. Um, and it's also like it's a, it's a different thing. You're multitasking. You're like maintaining an erection. You're like typing. You're like reading and like all that stuff. So I don't know. It was a nice uh, change. I've also never flown or done like that was why I was so inquisitive about everything. I've never flown. I've never done like half this stuff. So it's going to be a big first on multiple aspects. And the only experience I had with men was um, my friend used to just give me blowjobs and we'd hang out and smoke joints. That was it. <laughs> so that was my only experience. Um, I came out there. It's funny because um, – one of the very first things I went to film, the the other model, he was like, oh, what's something you haven't done? I'm like, I've never sucked a dick. And then Legrand comes out and he says, um, all right, Peter, you're going to suck a dick. <laughs> so the other model looked at me and I'm like, yep, well, here we go. And it, it went very, went well, so yeah. But it was a nice change because, yeah, it's different. You get to do some socializing. I got to do some traveling. I got to get to know the people. I got to try some acting. I got to have some sex versus me sitting in front of the computer like this and being like, hey, guys, tip for the shirt off.
<laughs> well, and what is so great about you meeting up with Legrand at that point in time is that the two of you launched Mormon Boys. And that is one of the few sites that immediately took off and had major repercussions in the mainstream, not just in the gay adult world. So what was that, what was that moment like where you started getting that kind of recognition for both of you? Me first or him? Oh, you first. I hear him talk all day long. Oh, okay. Um, so for me, I never really expor experienced much of the Mormon uh, culture. So it was also like a learning experience to experience like the, the initiations and the ordination and the, the outfits and find out like, you know, about all this, the secret like uh, gay background to Mormonism. And then there's a whole other multiple wives thing. And to learn more about that history was cool. And then once it came out, I realized that I was getting lots of attention because Mormon porn grabbed a lot of attention. And then me also being um, a person who performs in all industries, I also got even more attention. So I was getting all kinds of attention. And it was great because I don't mind attention. <laughs> and Legrand, I know that you hate attention. So were you cowering during this entire time? Uh, so, okay, so Mormon Boys started uh, because my husband and I on our honeymoon about four or five years before I met Peter. Um, on our honeymoon, we decided that we would we would uh, get into the porn industry, right? Um, and we thought that it'd be fun to do something that we were familiar with. We both grew up Mormon and we've both been Mormon missionaries. Um, and yes, we're very familiar with sort of the uh, elements of Mormon boys now and, and, and what would eventually be Mormon girls um, that, that was salacious and kind of interesting to people. The fact that you go into a Mormon temple and you take off your clothes and you're 19 and older men touch you and kind of anoint your body and wash your body, this is real. Um, and so, uh, we thought it would be if we were going to, you know, have fun uh, and just try our hand at porn, we would do a site called Mormon Boys. And so we did for about six months run pretty successfully a, um, a site that didn't really have a lot of sex, um, but it was mostly about missionaries sort of exposing themselves. And we ended up getting a job offer at the University of Minnesota, moved and relocated, um, relaunched when Book Mormon the Musical was big, so like two years later. Book of Mormon Musical was big on Broadway and Mitt Romney was running. Uh, and a year after that, right, so it was the Mormon moment, as we called it. Um, and, and we were launching what we considered to be not Mormon porn at all, just Mormonism was the vehicle by which you told a particular story. In this case, a daddy-son power dynamic story. Um, and it's in, in all kind of patriarchal organizations, the, the story is very, very similar. Uh, you have young men who very much want to do exactly what the older men you know, require of them so that they can rise up in the ranks and make people proud. And anyway, so uh, a year later, uh, Mormon Boys now, uh, after that Mormon moment, our relaunch, um, we had this phone call with Peter Pounder. Um, and we were talking about, you know, what we wanted to, you know, the, the sort of next phase. And it was going to be, um, you know, taking the attention that we had gotten and the kind of the exposure we got and having a lot of success and really having Peter be um, the face of it because he looks just like half of my Mormon missionary companions. Um, and he sort of had this like perfect, clean, innocent look. And I was like, and you're going to be going through these experiences for the first time. You're going to have anal sex for the first time. You're going to give a blow job. The first time. Like your expressions that he's like, am I going to have to act? And I'm like, not really, because it's going to be, <laughs> it's going to be like going through these experiences the first time, just like it was for me and for my husband when we went through and we were told to take our clothes off. And you're you have a real reaction to this, right? Uh, so we got we got to capture all of his very real uh, emotional responses to kind of being exposed to this sort of ritualized you know process, um, and him also experiencing sex for the first time, which was both sort of you know a curiosity, there was joy in it, there was excitement, there was nervousness. There, I mean, it's kind of a huge range of emotions when you're having sex with another guy for the first time, and he you know, experienced all of those things on film. And it was it was really, really fun. I mean, it was also kind of great to kind of work through it with him and talk to him about what we were doing. So Peter, is this a is this an instance where you actually lost your virginity on camera or did you have anal sex before before filming? For for, for me bottoming or topping? <clears throat> uh both. Oh. Uh well for me to hopping uh I mean I I topped uh, females, <laughs> so I never had anal sex with a, a man uh, topping until then. And same for bottoming, I hadn't had anal sex with a man until 
uh, I bought them on the website. Um, just to add to oh, the wow. whole first uh, first experience and everything, it's like the first time I had sex, there was a sound guy in the room, two camera guys, two video guys, a director. So yeah, it was interesting. That sounds pretty typical to me. Well, it depends. You know, sometimes uh, there's one guy, sometimes there's seven guys. Sometimes none of them have cameras and you're wondering why they're there. So, I mean, you, you were someone who worked with, who uh, parlayed the success of Mormon Boys and your stint with working with Legrand and his husband uh, into a much larger adult career. And you've worked with a lot of different studios. So what, what about Legrand and his company is so special that you're coming back to do some more with Carnal Media now? Um, mainly, I guess, just like the communication and openness between us. Um, we just, we bonded. Like my first visit, we, we bonded, like, you know, like leaving, I was upset and like tearing up and everything. Um, <clears throat> and other studios didn't really seem like that. You know, like I'm some social person, but um, it just, it wasn't the same as that their, their studio that him and his husband were running. Um, and yeah, I just felt comfortable enough to like mention any issues or like if I had any ideas and I didn't feel like I should hold back with any, like I'd message a grand all the time with like, I learned this, you know, do you think this would apply or do you think this would help? Or like, you know, I've done some research and blah, 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 sex stuff. So uh, I just <laughs> like the communication. It felt more like a family versus more um, just a studio I went and worked at. Yeah. And LeGrand, I mean, Peter, Peter's coming back and we're going to get into this in just a second, but Peter's coming back into the, the adult, into the porn studio world to work exclusively with Carnal. Uh, why? when he approached you, did you say, uh, yes, absolutely. What is it so great about Peter Pounder? I mean, Peter Cra Pounder is my man crush. There's no way that uh, we were gonna say no. Um, you know, uh, so so Peter coming back out of retirement uh, is something that I was aware of because we've been, so we mm -hmm. developed a friendship. We've been in touch um, before he went into retirement, while he was in retirement, um, and while he was considering kind of what he wanted to do. Um, just as friends, uh, no real sense that the communication was anything other than, you know, hey, how are you doing? I'm kind of checking in. Um, uh, and I think that, um, I think as Peter said, there's a sense that uh, Peter is very much family for us. Um, so when we think about stuff that we've done together, when we think about the people that we've worked with, um, you know, you develop a very close relationship with some people. Um, you know, not everyone, but some people you really do. And, and uh, you know, it, it felt right. It felt like this is a, this is a really natural fit for you to come back and work with us. We're going to be launching, uh, we're relaunching Mormon Boys. Um, we had gone through pretty serious trauma, um, you know, in the time that we, that Peter wasn't in the industry. And Peter also went through his own trauma. Um, and so one of the reasons why we were staying in touch is because we had both gone through some pretty uh, horrific and challenging things. Um, and, and we sort of, you know, reached out to each other during that time, uh, to talk about that. Um, and that was helpful, uh, for me. Um, and, and it was, it was useful to have, um, a conversation with someone who I really care about, who I could share and be open with. And he, he knew all of the elements of kind of what was going on for me. And, um, I was becoming more and more familiar with his world. Um, and so that was, uh, you know, on, on the other end, Chronal Media has been, you know, founded. It's been created. We're growing. Um, it just seemed really natural to have uh, our family come back together. You know, our real family come back together and um, work together. Uh, now that we're doing this, you know, kind of incredible uh, project and we're doing really well, things are kind of blowing up. Uh, we want Peter to be part of it. So, and on that note, uh, Legrand, you, you, and your husband Jay lost control of family dick and Mormon boys uh, after some really just straight out of Melrose place uh, machinations from some some uh, people at the company. But you launched Carnal Media and one of the first sites that you launched was Gay Sest, which is the uh, superior version of family dick now. And you never did anything with Mormon boys until now. And you have a new reboot of Mormon boys. It's like Gossip Girl 2.0. <laughs> Everyone's very excited about uh, Masonic Boys, and I have the trailer right now, which Peter Pounder has not yet seen. True. Let's watch it now, shall we? <laughs> I 
Am I blushing? You can't even see through my sunburn. Oh my goodness, <clears throat> Legrand. That is filthy. Yeah, we're pretty excited about it. I'm pretty excited about it. <clears throat> uh, so, Peter, what did you think when Legrand pitched this to you? The 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 what for the idea for Masonic Boys? Yeah, yeah. No, um, I was excited because I like doing the stuff we did before, um, and is through like through his direction and everything. I'm excited every, for every, how that's all going to turn out. And seeing the trailer, um, it reminded me of some of my past, and I'm excited for more of the future and to also meet some of these people. Some of the people I know, some of the people I don't. And I like how everything is like, um, the Grand's always had like a very, like all the all their content is usually very like crisp and clean looking and whatnot, um, as to, uh, opposed to like some other sites that have different shooting styles. So I like that he's kept the shooting style that I like the look of. <laughs> well, LeGrand, one of the things that I think separates Cornell Media content from other studios is that you are, and you alluded to your research background earlier, but you are much more interested in the dynamics of sexual play and fantasy and power dynamics specifically between older men and younger men and what those look like. But by that same token, that's why you have the fans that you have, but by the same token, you also get dinged a lot by moral crusaders who want to talk about uh, consent represented in your films. And I know that that's a big, that's a big topic for you. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, what, what, what exactly do you want to talk about there? Because there are quite a few things that we could talk about. Uh, well, I'm thinking specifically of that uh, of an article that recently got published that included that did not reference your content, but included a photo of from one of the from one of Cornell Media's films, and specifically discussed the uh, the problems of showing a sleeping boy being fondled and is that supposed to be a turn on or is that supposed to be a warning <laughs> which if you're watching porn is presumably supposed to be a turn on right and why wouldn't it be uh the place for fantasy is not in real life it's in porn right so something that would be wildly inappropriate uh we can watch on the silver screen right you you can imagine uh that all of the fans of slasher movies would be dismayed if suddenly the same moral crusaders apply the logic that they're trying to apply to porn to slasher films and say, oh my God, you can't show this on you know, the silver screen. You can't go to movie theaters and see slasher films because it's showing people decapitating others, right? It's showing people dismembering others. Uh, this, is, this is horrible. You're taking away someone's life, um, you know? <laughs> yeah, and that's why it's in a movie and <laughs> not, not something that we expect to happen in real life. And if it does, then we have a legal system that will Hopefully, uh, you know, we have justice to those people who are uh, murderers. Um, so, in in the case of uh, in the case of porn, um, where we are creating fantasies, our product is to give someone an orgasm. It's one of the reasons why we think we have one of the greatest products on the planet. We're giving people uh, a clean, uh, private um, orgasm in the privacy of the room, even if they happen to live in a country that, you know, uh, criminalizes homosexuality. Um, you're not going to get an STD from watching porn. Uh, <laughs> you're going to get off and you're going to, um, you know, really be able to explore and kind of enrich your uh, sense of kink and things that, that turn you on, things that, you know, arouse you, um, which is fantastic. Um, so let's talk about that particular article for a second. Um, you know, the, the discussion is, you know, around things like triggers, people who have experienced, um, uh, you know, unconsensual touch, uh, people who have been um, in their real life experienced things that they should not have, uh, things that are legal. And then, uh, and then it juxtaposes that with, uh, you know, porn that depicts things, right, or, or movies, but in this case, sexual movies, movies that depict things uh, that for some people they've actually maybe experienced and have you know trauma around, and and what I would say is the same thing that I would say to someone who's experienced any type type of trauma. It, it, you have personal responsibility to watch or not watch, engage or not engage with those things that um, are going to be problematic for you. So don't watch movies, whether or not they are pornographic films or uh, you know not pornographic films, that might cause you uh, additional 
you know, trauma might kind of reopen wounds for you. Uh, and for others, um, you know, I think uh, there's plenty of data that shows that people can engage with fantasy and engage with uh, exploring in a healthy way the things that they're turned on by or the things that excite them uh, without it spilling over to the real world, right? This was a huge debate in the uh, gaming industry. Um, kids who play violent video games, they're just going to turn out to be, you know, mass murdering fuckheads. <laughs> that it's not true. Uh, it well, turns it's out like, it's, it's like it's like Tipper Gore going after porn rock. If you listen to too many Prince songs, you're going to be a sex addict or whatever she thought was going to happen, which she regrets now. She has apologized for that whole movement, but it's too little, too late, Tipper. Yeah, a little too late. Uh, but I mean, with fantasy, I mean, Peter, you're, you've, you've been retired from the porn industry, but you've been very active on the fan platforms, OnlyFans Just for Fans and camming. So when it comes to fantasy, like, how what are you encountering the most from people who are subscribed to your to your content well uh actually to be honest for the past two and a half years that i was retired i didn't really participate in most of those platforms uh i selectively only did uh only fans because it was super private and i was trying to do mainstream and stuff and i wasn't sure about my nudes so i actually kind of like changed everything i changed my name for a bit um went through an identity crisis <laughs> um and yeah, so, uh, you know, just to say that, I, I did not participate much over the past few years. So I took like a little bit of a break. <clears throat> uh, what was your original question? Uh, what, what are the fantasies that you're encountering from people who are a fan of Peter Pounder? Well, you know, it depends on what their fetish is. You know, there's a lot of people who want to see more feet. There's a lot of people who want to see more of the booty. Um, a lot of people love my ass. Um, and I've kind of gotten away from a lot of those activities just with some health concerns and whatnot. So everyone's still like, hey, hey, let me see, let me see. Uh, most of the people want what they can't have or what they can't see. So they ask for the things that I haven't been doing. Um, aside from that, I've noticed also just a more genuine interest in like <clears throat> getting to know me as a person um, through the sexual stuff and what I like versus what I just show or what they see. So like they want to see stuff that actually I'm into. They want to see me working out. Uh, when I get out of the shower and I record myself just being goofy and dancing and whatever, and like, you no know, helicopter dick and like whatever. <laughs> so I'm just noticing more of a, a connection with people. More people want more of a connection for their sexual material, their, what they're getting off to. They want it to actually be part of me versus part of what I'm told to do. Yeah, yeah. I think that- No, I think the, that that's one of the major shifts in, in <clears throat> oh no, you go. You know better more about this than I do. <laughs> No, I was going to say, I think that's the, the, the big distinction between um, kind of the, the beauty of and, and what is awesome about the fan content that people generate. Um, it's it's not just tacky reality uh, television porn, right? Um, it's, you know, having some type of connection with the individual um, and getting to know that individual, hopefully, uh, maybe a bit of a, about their personality, uh, but you're connecting with them versus studio work, which can, uh, which is more akin to uh, movies. So doing something, and if you're an actor, you can have sort of your following, you can have an Instagram and you can kind of do your gardening and have people follow you because you're a human being and it's interesting and you're Harrison Ford, but then you actually play very interesting and compelling roles in Hollywood films. And that actually elevates uh, people's awareness of who you are and what you're doing. Uh, and then maybe they might be even more interested in you as a human being. Um, and so the, uh, the fan platforms are doing a really phenomenal job of allowing models to connect directly with uh, their fans and to monetize that in a way that um, is important um, and democratized. Um, the, the thing about fantasy, and th I mean, fantasy is, is another way to describe sort of these, these movies that sort of tell a narrative and, it's, and you're, you're sort of immersed sometimes in that narrative as opposed to, I guess, studio porn that's just suck and fuck. And, and yes, there's some great, well-lit suck and fuck porn where there's nothing really to it and you just put you know, people together and they suck and fuck. Um, but what we do is we, you know, ours are movies, the ours are sort of series that have chapters to them. Um, and uh, for us, it's important that we kind of have that experience for the user that says, here is a person who you might find incredibly sexy and talented, et cetera, and you should go and check them out. And on a personal level, they're also very interesting. And they are playing a particular role. 
and it gets them a much broader uh, audience uh, in some cases than they get otherwise. And I mean, and, and right now with the, with fan platforms being so new, uh, fan uh, models are able to make in many cases, you know, really high performing models are able to make money uh, in ways that they would not have been able to make um, in, the, in the adult industry, which is phenomenal. Um, and as these things continue to move, we'll see, you know, uh, hopefully attitudes shift and, and, and people continue to like become more sex positive. Um, while simultaneously places like Twitter and Facebook and elsewhere are becoming less sex positive and sex friendly. Um, hopefully we have, uh, you know, more opportunities for studio work for models that really promotes and kind of helps them make additional money on their fan platform of choice. Well, Peter, what, what I want to know is with the rise of the fan platforms and your retirement and stepping away from all of it, why, what about carnal media made you want to get back into studio porn? Um, well, the platforms, like you said, they've been taking off, especially in the last year um, with COVID and everything. And what, what sparked the idea of me coming back out of retirement is like I was trying mainstream and I didn't want to do like background acting with uh, COVID and like 100 people on set. Like I mentioned going back to sex work and one of my friends was like, yeah, but you're, having, you're like, you're a lot closer to the person. I'm like, so a cough is a cough four people in a room and a cough is better than a hundred people in a room and a cough. It doesn't matter if I'm penetrating the people or not. Um, <laughs> so, and I was just looking at what was out there and, 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 and the talent and some of it was probably part partially ego. I see people and I think like, you know, I, I, I could have, you know, that might've looked a lot better like with me, you know, that's just an ego thing um, and stuff like that. So then I started thinking about what we're coming out of it. And I thought about how, the, how much money I've lost out on the past year, just waiting for COVID to end and stuff. Um, but I didn't want to like put too much out there until I made a decision. So then we started talking more about our possibilities and opportunities. And I know that I would have work that I trust the people I'm working with or cause I either know them or I trust who he's going to hire. Um, and it's mostly just the comfortability and thinking, you know what, for exposure wise and coming back to a studio that I want to work with. And it's not really just like one studio, it's like a network of things or of studios, right? So um, that's gonna, that's, that, that felt safe to me. Like, like a, go back and work with your family, like network that you yeah. started with. Um, and then like LeGrand was saying with um, exposure and like the studios and the fan platforms, they all just feed into one another, right? And you, for your fan platforms, you have to advertise it versus like the studio work, it's advertising for you. And then people see that and then they can just trace it back to your fan, your fan platform. Well, and now you're back, but what precipitated the retirement to begin with? <laughs> Multiple things, all like a few factors, you know, part of it was um, I started to run into issues traveling, being Canadian and trying to like uh, get visas and all that kind of stuff. It just became uh, more of a hassle. And there was some personal stuff with relationships and there was, um, I changed relationships too, and it was just a lot of new stuff coming up. So it was relationships, it was dis the distance of work, like the amount of shoots in Canada was very spaced apart, like every three months or two months, it wasn't like steady enough. So um, I started to feel like I was half-assing what I could be doing. So I decided to try something else. And I went into trying something else. I planned on like maybe acquiring the visas through that and then coming back, uh, but still sorting that out. <laughs> So um, the retirement was mostly just, you know what? Can't seem to do that much here. Um, a lot of the people I know locally, like where I was living, I didn't want to hook up with or something with. <laughs> um, there was relationship and then I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna try a different life for a bit, which I did. And I'm not really a vanilla person or a monogamous person. So I learned that. Something that um, I think is worth bringing up um, you know, because uh, Peter and I stayed in touch. Uh, when, when he shot with us, we were a very young company. We weren't in a position to offer an exclusive uh, relationship much like we are now. So we're in much, you know, where we are now, uh, we had never even, uh, we hadn't achieved with uh, Mormon boys and family dick and young perps. And, and even with the trauma that happened to us, um, we've exceeded, you know, the success that we experienced there by, by several times over and, and, and we're really proud of that. 
Um, and that allows us to do something like offer an exclusive relationship with Peter, which we wouldn't have been able to do back then. Um, and because we couldn't, that meant that Peter also wanted to go and get work like he's talking about. So he went and he worked with others. Um, and it was important because Peter wasn't the only one. Uh, people who we considered to be family who were going out, they'd worked with us, they'd have a great experience. Maybe it was their very first time having sex uh, ever. Maybe it wasn't, but it was their first time in porn. Um, we wanted to be supportive of them as they went out and they had experiences with other people in the industry. And our philosophy was go out and make as much money as you can and make a name for yourself and have a good time. Um, and uh, and some of those experiences for Peter were really good and um, the majority of them were and some weren't. Um, and as those experiences weren't particularly good, it was pretty eye-opening for us as well because uh, as someone who is the CEO of this company, uh, I'm also a performer. Um, and it's extremely important to me that um, that that performers uh, are valued <laughs> as much as anyone else who's playing any other role in the adult industry. And sometimes it felt like in the adult industry, people who are performers were not valued as much as the people who are running the studios, or the people who are holding the camera. Um, and it was really upsetting. And there were lots of different experiences that um, were instructive for me, but I, I wasn't actually shooting uh, content for other studios. So I was getting a lot of information uh, about some of these other studios who I'd interacted with on a business level, right? And I had personal relationships with them, but not as a performer. Uh, suddenly I was getting information back from Peter and others who were uh, interacting with these people um, as a performer. And in some cases, um, he would experience things that uh, violated his boundaries of consent or violated, um, you know, uh, some of the uh, Anyway, I'll leave it there. I mean, Peter can kind of expound it if he'd like or not. Um, but it was um, it was really upsetting um, and it was really eye opening, um, especially since um, there was a culture of not believing. I mean, just like there was a culture of not believing women in the Me Too movement. Right. And, and, and really having watched the Me Too movement, like women having a hard time really coming out and saying this is what happened, even in the moment, but but also afterwards. Um, that this is what's happened to me. I didn't always fully appreciate why um, that would happen, but I, I think it was easier for me to understand there than in the gay adult industry. I just thought, well, if you're in the gay adult industry, of course, someone does something, you're gonna say something immediately. And, and Peter's experience has led me to realize that that's not the case. Um, there are lots of people who experience things and they're discredited or they're sort of told that didn't really happen, um, gaslighting them and uh, it makes them very anxious if they want to do lots of work in the industry, if they want to uh, have additional opportunities, if they speak out, they worry. Maybe I'll lose my opportunity to continue to, you know, grow in this industry that I really love and care about. And uh, back then, you know, when you talk to Peter, he would say, "This is my dream. This I have. This is what I want to do with my life. Um, I want nothing more. Like my like everything has been leading to this moment. I want to be in porn." Uh, I was born to be in porn. This is my industry. Uh, I want to own it. Um, and uh, that's where he was at. Nothing was going to deter him from sort of being 100% in this industry that he was that he loved and he was passionate about. Um, and yet he had some of these experiences. And so um, I think it's important to recognize that when he's coming back and working with us, part of that is because um, both of us really sort of learned quite a bit about some of the other things that are happening in the industry. Um, and we feel really important really passionately about um, putting performers first and um, consent and um, yeah, like I said, I'll leave it there. I'll let Peter sort of pick up. Um, I guess I was always under the impression of like, yeah, you don't want to ruin a business opportunity and like, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it kind of thing. And I've noticed this with other people I know that, it, of, you know, went from cam work into studio work and then everything seemed great. And then later they've come out and been like, well, it wasn't actually, or like there was this change in conversation that we, I didn't know about. And like, anyways, I realized this is a common thing. So, you know, I guess I, I should uh, talk about it. Um, it. Makes me like a little bit uh, nervous because I like talking about positive things and whatnot. But um, <clears throat> so I guess like the, the one that I, I didn't realize, I didn't, I felt violated after this one incident happened um, where I was supposed to film with a model and I was, uh, they were sick. They weren't going to film with me. That's understandable. I have another model. It's all cool. Um, but we had to share a bed. Um, so I went to sleep and then I remember 
waking up and kind of just being like pulled across the bed. And I'm like, you can't film, right? You're sick. And then they're like, well, I guess I'll have sex. And I'm like, now at the time, like I, I know I said I didn't want to. I don't know if I, you know, blatantly just said like, no. <laughs> um, but the other uh, model was quite had quite a lot more uh, fame than me. So I was also like nervous because of the whole like, stardom kind of aspect of it and like who's going to believe who and like everything um so then you know sex is starting to happen and i'm not really prepared to do any of this <laughs> so i didn't have any time to do my usual like warming up and all this and then i didn't want the other person to uh come in me and then they were like i'm coming and i'm still kind of like like what like you know um and at the time it was, I was half awake and all this stuff. So I, I didn't like register at all. And then like the next day I said to the people, um, who booked the rooms, I never want to share another room. I have issues sleeping and I get too hot. And I, I didn't say what had happened. I just said that I don't want to share another bed with another, uh, <clears throat> model, which the next time they booked two beds. So, <laughs> um, but they didn't know about like what had really had happened. Um, am I supposed to say the name? You can, um, you do not have to. Okay. Well, this person has been outed anyways. And, um, I didn't realize until I read more about it, that he's been doing this to other people. It was, um, uh, uh, Topher DiMaggio. Yeah. That's the name, right? Yeah. That's his name. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you know, I've, I've spoke to people who, who know him now. And they said that like, it was one of those things where like, you know, you don't realize like what you're doing until like a bunch of people like point it out. So apparently I guess he's learned. Um, and I guess I never felt the need to say anything after I heard that he's kind of like learned from his mistakes and all this kind of stuff, but uh, I don't mind saying it. So yeah, I, I've been told that that was coerced rape. I don't like the word rape cause it sounds terrible. Coerced or yeah. Um, so yeah, that happened. Um, and then the other thing um, that happened was <laughs> the other thing that happened um, was when I was filming at uh, Guys in Sweatpants, and it was a live cam show, so <laughs> it's a live cam show, and um, so you, you're trying to like please the audience and like communicate without like you know, talking too much and this whole thing, right? So there was a, a guy that I thought was really cute, uh, Elliot Blue, and we'd filmed, we had we filmed yet? Either, we were supposed to film. I had a little crush on him. Um, I think it was probably one of my first like uh, crushes. And uh, anyways, so we're, we're doing this and, I ha and I've, I've experimented with getting ready for bottoming, so I have butt plugs. So I had like a butt plug in for the show. Um, and then Austin wanted to, 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 to fuck me. And I didn't want that to be like, like multiple things. Like I know I was going to do my first bottoming experience at Legrand's uh, studio and everything like that. So right, that Austin, who's Austin? The, the owner of uh, guys in sweatpants. Austin. Wild. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. So anyways, he wanted to do that. Um, I think he said, okay, I'll just put it in like once or something like that. And, it's kind of, I don't remember exactly because I don't have, I'm not watching the video, but I remember it went to, it went to happen. He did, he did put it in once, then he took it right out. And then, and then that was it. And I felt like a little uncomfortable, but like, I kind of just like brushed it off. It was like, it was nothing like whatever. And I moved forward with it. Um, and I kind of just like pushed that to the back of my memory for the longest time, <clears throat> but um, it wasn't okay. Like, you know, there should be more communication um, before it happened. And, I have no idea if he realizes the boundary that he stepped over there or that he should have been, you know, having a better commun communication practice, you know, before set, not before set, before cam show, whatever, to avoid these issues. I don't know if he knows. I mean, if he sees this, he'll know. <laughs> but, um, so you haven't, you haven't spoken to him about it since it happened? No. And like, there was times when like he had asked me to come out and shoot later and I like very specifically made sure it was only for what I was comfortable with and stuff. And I never end up happening, never end up going out there. I think it had to do with wanting to change my pay or something. I don't recall. Um, but anyways, and then after this whole thing had happened, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't count that like as my first time bottoming like that to me, that's not a bottoming experience. That's not like, 
a sex experience that's, I don't know, just we didn't register as that. So then when I did my first bottoming experience at Legrand's studio, and then he, Austin starts saying, um, yeah, well, you know, I fucked him first, first time on my site and everything. Like, I didn't like that. I thought that was rude. Um, but I was also just trying to stay out of the drama. So I didn't like speak up or say anything. I just kind of like stayed out of it because I didn't want to be part of that um, attention, I guess. Um, but I know the grand uh, handled it and defended that it was the first time on his site, which I vouch for it was. <laughs> Um, and anyways, so those are the two kind of negative things, I guess, that kind of happened. Um, and other than that, I've just, I've generally had a good experience in the industry because I make sure I communicate well, but those are just two times I didn't, or I'm things to be, are better. To be sure, one thing that is very true about Peter and that um, has made it, uh, you know, a, a, a fantastic relationship for us is that Peter goes out of his way to communicate, ask lots and lots of questions ahead of time, right? So he will ask. He wants to know how to be prepared. He'll ask, you know, what do I need to do to prep? What's actually going to happen? Um, even if there's stuff that we say, hey, we're going to actually sort of need you to roll with the punches here because this part is going to be a little bit unscripted. We're, we're going to kind of try out a couple of things. We at least walk through the the parameters of what that's going to look like, right? So we'll kind of explain, you know, in general, this is, is generally speaking the type of things we'll be looking at. And we're going to be looking to you to sort of say, yeah, I can do that or I can't. But you know, if you're going to bottom, we'll of course let you know um, as much in advance as possible, so you can go and, and clean out, and you can also talk to us about whether or not that's something you're ready or prepared to do. Um, and you know, when he when he when he brought this up, you know that it happened, and of course, we didn't know everything that had taken place. I didn't know. My husband and I didn't really know until Peter showed up, um, and and Peter got a bit emotional about it as he was sort of describing what had taken place, um, and. Um, you know, it was very clear to us uh, that this person wasn't just, you know, tweeting something to be sort of like a dick and say like, yeah, actually, no, you bottomed up, you know, my site first and, and Peter's like, it didn't. Um, but actually it was, you know, um, someone almost bragging about violating someone, right? And 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 that, and, and especially since Peter was having sort of this big emotional response um, to it, um, for us, it was, totally and completely unacceptable. And it was the first time we'd, we'd seen this. And of course, since then, we've we've run into other experiences with other performers who've gone and worked elsewhere and had experiences. Peter also, after this, started really establishing boundaries with people he worked with, right? And, and we talked about it. So he, he would say, hey, I'm gonna go and work with Seth. Have you heard anything about this group? And I'd tell him if I'd heard anything about them or not. And then we'd put him in touch with people who'd worked with them. And then we'd walk through, like, this is how you need to establish your boundaries. And this is, you know, and, and it, it's, it's instructive because when it comes to sex and it comes to being on camera, uh, you need to be able to say, you're allowed to ask me to do certain things, but I do not have to do them, right? And you need to be able to sort of like, uh, part of what Jay and I, my husband and I wanted to do was impart, you know, to, to Peter and others, this sense that, you know, those boundaries, just because you're there at a studio and, and you're working it, they want you to do something, that doesn't mean that you have to. Um, and, and that involves a lot of communication and, and dialogue, and, and that doesn't have to be unfriendly, right? You can have a very friendly back and forth about it. You can say, actually, I, I really appreciate that's what you want me to do. I, I don't want to do that. I'm more than happy to do lots of things. I just don't want to do that. Um, and you need to be able to you know, say no uh, when you need to without having the fear of being, I don't know, whatever the equivalent of canceled, you know, as a performer is because you're not willing to do certain things on the spot on the fly that you didn't agree to do ahead of time um and, and, and i think that those lessons led to peter becoming very gifted at also helping others <clears throat> their voice because he would talk to a lot of other performers about how they could communicate and that is of course what we want we want our what we know to be transferred to the models we work with to be transferred to other models so that most people in the industry kind of start getting that exposure to this is what real consent and real communication looks like. Peter's good at it. Well, Peter, I'm so sorry that you had those experiences, but I'm glad that you had time away from the industry and I'm even more happy that you reconnected with Legrand and are coming out of retirement to do Cornell Media shoots. <clears throat> it's definitely been a journey, a lot more self-awareness these days. Yeah. Uh, well, I can't wait to see Masonic Boys launch. And Peter, I can't wait to see what other Cornell Media properties you are going to pop up in. Peter, what are your favorites so far of the things that you've seen? 
What are you most excited to, to uh, do? For like the network? Mm -hmm. Right now we're at like, uh, I think you're aware of most of them. I saw the email going back and forth. So we're at like something like 28 sites. Which of the sites are you most excited about? Twink Top. <laughs> yep. Yeah, because yeah, when we originally <laughs> spoke about this years ago, like we you know there was ideas for the future and all that stuff, and I wanted to be part of it, and then um, I stepped away. So now I'm stepping back. I can be part of something that I'm not sure how much I had as inspiration towards the idea, but I feel, I feel like I probably have a had a big part of the inspiration towards the idea. So yeah, I'm looking forward towards that one. Um, I liked the uh, stuff we did with the. Uh, Chap, like the the ordination and like the the kind of temple stuff. So um, that'd be fun to do that again. Um, and what you have um, what do you call it? You have something. Oh, you have a site. You have something I haven't done before, which I want to do, and that is the uh, female to male side. You have yeah, Jock Pussy. So we're the only network. Um, we're the only company that has an actively updating. Um, actually, two actively updating uh, after M sites and soon. To be quite a few more. We're launching three more in the next uh, year and a half. But yeah, so the F to M content, um, the other Canadian uh, that we, you know, have become very good friends with, Jay James, he has shot uh, for Jock Pussy. Um, and uh, we're very excited to have you shoot uh, on Jock Pussy as well. But just just to be clear, yes, things got it. We, we back in the day had been talking about Twink Top. It was one of our plans of things that we were going to launch. That you, so you were part of Growl Boys. You were going to be part of Twink Top. You're going to be part of all these sites you're going to launch. Uh, unfortunately, got a little uh, sidetracked. Um, some of those properties did launch as part of a separate venture. But now we have the opportunity because we've launched them as part of Carnal Media to mm -hmm. bring you back in. And we are super excited to have you on it. Super excited to be part of it. Yeah, it's going to be fun. Well, let's consider this the Peter Pounder period of Carnal Media. Peter, it was lovely to get to know you a little bit today. And Legrand, it was nice to be in charge of a meeting with you for once. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you so much. All right. Thank, thank you, guys. And thank, thank you. all of you for watching.